Well, I'm really pleased to be joined by Andy Burnham and Andy Street today, who are the mayors of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority and the West Midlands Combined Authority. And we're here today to talk about the progress that's been made in both of those regions in terms of supporting people who've been sleeping rough during the coronavirus outbreak. And really importantly, we're also here to discuss what further measures could be put in place so that we can seize upon this progress and ensure that we have long lasting change in both of these regions when it comes to ending homelessness and ending rough sleeping going forwards. I wanted to begin by asking you both to describe what has been achieved in your local regions through the Everyone In initiative. So genuinely, almost everybody has been in. Our total numbers were about 800 people have moved in and of those 150 had no recourse to public funds. So the thing that should be said is this has been an incredible effort on behalf, particularly of our seven local authorities and all of the charity and third sector partners who do support them. But it genuinely has happened. Uh, Similar, um, but in many ways, we've done more than we expected to do. So at the start of uh, Everyone In, when we took a very early decision to, um, to offer uh, people accommodation. We anticipate about a thousand people. In the end, we've um, doubled that. So almost 2,000 people have been offered a placement. And I think that reflects the fact that uh, lockdown made some people homeless. So there was an extra uh, kind of arrival of people on the streets who perhaps were in home arrangements that kind of became unsustainable in the in the lockdown period so 2000 people in an amazing network of faith groups community groups uh, just people pulling together to support people in hotels lives turned round just some amazing stories that have have, have come through and um, yeah the question i've got in my mind is why should it take a crisis for us to do the right thing? Surely, if we can do this in the middle of a pandemic, we can do it in more ordinary times. But I, I, I just think if the government, you know, everyone in has got to mean everyone in. Because, you know, the question for the government, I think, coming out of this is, if everyone in is to be a kind of permanent ambition, which it, which it is, if it's to end rough sleeping, it's incompatible, in my view, with a policy of no recourse to public funds, because that policy says, well, there'll always be some people uh, out on the streets and it can't therefore be everyone in um, and you can't kind of bank on charity to to do the rest so you know I, I think some progress has been made in this period but I think we need a long-term sustainable solution that reflects the fact that we're a, a country that should not as a Christian country if you want to call us that legitimize um, destitution in law it shouldn't happen. So Andy, if I can hand over to you, are those those similar sort of measures needed in the West Midlands as well, would you say, going forward? Well, I think perhaps the the first thing to say is that uh, citizens here have actually been really appreciative of the effort around everyone in. But the next thing they tend to say to me is, and don't let us ever slip back. And I think there is a real sort of moment for us to say we did do something that we can be proud of in adversity. And we've got to be absolutely certain that we're determined not to slip back. Now, that's very easy to say, hard to do. And so the next part of the chain has to be what further cash is coming forward to help our local authorities with the enormous challenge that they have to move people on. Now, of course, the government have said there'll be nearly 300 million for this year, a mix of revenue for support and money for accommodation. And actually, the first thing in terms of lobbying I would call out is that money's got to flow quickly because there is a real task to be done on the ground right now to move people into that move on accommodation with the right support to help people establish their lives. But then what we've got to do is we've got to look at what are the underlying issues. The way our task force has talked about this has talked about the sort of designing out of homelessness and rough sleeping. What are the issues that really have led this to be? a constant finger in the dam approach over the last few years. And there you do ultimately get to the whole question of the supply of affordable housing and obviously making sure that benefits are appropriate for people to be able to stay in their accommodation. So it's the immediacy of that financial support. And then it's looking at some of those underlying issues to really sort of seize the psychological moment of we're not going to slip back.
Are there any other areas of national government policy during this period that have helped you to provide support to people to move into accommodation? You'll know that both of our regions are trials for Housing First, which I'm a great believer in because it provides the support as well as the accommodation. And one of my worries at the beginning of the pandemic was that somehow we'd lose our progress with that. And actually the converse has been true. So when we did our count numbers and they were announced back in February, we had 160 people on that programme. We've now, during the period of the pandemic, we've moved to 230. So actually it's been really good that we haven't lost any momentum on that, to the contrary. And although the nature of support has had to change with all the rules, we've absolutely kept to it. And I'm actually really pleased with that as well. Similar for, for us, Hannah, Housing First has been a really valuable option here as, as we've tried to then carry everyone in to everyone with somewhere to go beyond the um, emergency uh, accommodation. So, you know, sometimes people think about homelessness and rough sleeping, oh, it's all too complicated and this, that and the other. And actually it's not, to be honest, it's, it's reasonably simple. If you give people a settled place that is of a decent quality, where they can have their needs met on an ongoing basis, uh, human beings are such that they can recover very quickly and they can then turn things around from that, that sort of sound platform of a, of a solid place to be for a prolonged period of time uh, that is of good quality. Housing First as a, as a sort of project needs to sort of become a philosophy that underpins our whole approach to not just homelessness actually, but to, to society. I, I don't think anybody in this life has got health and well-being without good housing behind them they just haven't and you know when i went to finland um last year i was really struck that housing first was a sort of shared national philosophy it wasn't just a project it was something that said all public services need to recognize that without good housing you can't have good health a good education a good life you know it's the foundation for everything and I think we should be adopting that principle into into UK uh, policy making, and I I think housing first should become our guiding national philosophy too. So, thinking about going forward, what more do you think needs to be put in place so that we can build on the progress that has been achieved over the last few months and ensure that there everybody that's been helped can move into a home of their own, but also thinking about the support that we provide to people who might become homeless over the next couple of months. There are immediate things around local housing allowance um, and making sure that the rates match actual rents. I think there are issues around evictions and we need to see the government um, commit to ending those fast track no fault evictions. They've said they will before and we need to really see that um, uh, see that come through. There are two big things now that are overdue in this country. One is regulation of the private rented sector more broadly because often we see very poor standards of accommodation that don't support people's health and well-being demands placed upon people from a financial point of view uh, it, it can add to the precariousness of the way people live uh, poorly maintained private rented properties often drag communities down and then secondly you know this surely is a moment to solve the housing crisis isn't it if we're going to build 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 well, let's make sure that part of that building is zero carbon uh, homes for social rent. You know, this is a great opportunity to build a 21st century generation of council or social housing that is of the highest uh, standards. So, you know, I would say that, you know, as we look to recovery, you know, housing, I think, needs to be at the heart of that uh, recovery. And actually learning the lessons from this pandemic, you know, why have our poorest communities been hardest hit by the virus? And I think it's a combination of poor work and poor housing so people unable to self-isolate because they don't get financial support to do that so they stay in work and then perhaps going home to, to a house that is overcrowded where they can't um, separate easily from other people in the house and those poorest communities I think have been really hit hard as, as a result of these things so leveling up must start in our poorest communities improve people's work give people more security uh, in employment and then secondly improve people's housing be that in the private rented sector or by building uh, new social housing that that gives the country and, the, and our poorest communities a basic level of resilience uh, going forward from here because even though we're in a pandemic now we don't know when when the next one will hit us.
I do think this whole question of the local housing allowance rate and is really crucial. We've been talking about this for years here. Just to give you the background, the LHA rate pre-COVID afforded 2% of rental accommodation in Birmingham. That is just not doing its job. We've had a move to that 30% level. It has got to be sustained at that sort of level. And to me, that's the whole sort of dignity of benefits. So that has to happen as a really specific call out right now. Then the second thing that has to be addressed is the supply of genuinely affordable accommodation. And I have to say, I agree with what Andy B said, that we are looking at this whole acceleration of build, build, build. We're very clear, housing is the fastest way to reflate the economy, but we have to make sure there's a balance to provide genuine affordable accommodation within that. We've done work here to redefine affordable. We don't put any West Midlands Combined Authority money into any scheme unless 20% affordable has been achieved. And that is by what it buys rather than actually its relation to uh, housing costs. So it's a genuine measure. And I'd like to see that sort of thinking here developed across the country. Can you tell us both why you support the Crisis Home for All campaign to introduce emergency homelessness legislation? Because it, it, it is the first um, kind of foundation of a, of a a national housing first policy. I think that's what we're, we're saying today, isn't it? You know, that it should be um, enshrined in law. We, we should, as I said before, a country like ours, put a roof over every head every night of the week. It's as simple as that. I, I think this is a time to invest, you know, because actually if you were to build a new generation of social housing that was also zero carbon, it would be um, a, a way of bringing the housing benefit bill down on a, on a longer term basis. So it's not always about sort of, you know, sort of things we can't afford. Actually, we, we, we can afford it because we will be able to uh, to offset the costs of retrofitting against, you know, cutting people's energy bills or um, building social housing because we can reduce the housing benefit bill. I think this is a moment to build. I think we all agree across the political spectrum uh, about that. Go to some of these brownfield sites. And to be fair, the government is doing that. Andy's had money to this. We've got money to do it. Let's start cleaning up some of the brownfield sites and build there but let me just add before i finish on this point uh, hannah i'm all in favor actually of rethinking places and converting office or retail space into residential space and to you know recreate some of our towns that are going to be different coming out of this definitely but please you know let's not build a new generation of of slum housing by you know creating kind of you know quite kind of slipshod sort of properties within converted office blocks and um, I don't think that is the kind that is not build back better to me that is that is a slightly dangerous way of uh, of, of doing this you know uh, I think it's quality that we what, what we've learned from everyone in is if you give people quality space to be in then that can improve their health and well-being if you um, create uh, poor quality insecure housing then we, we, we aren't going to escape this cycle that we're in. Thank you, Andy. And just to hand over to the other Andy, I wondered whether or just how important you thought that kind of legal framework is going forward to ensure that we have that consistency of approach across local councils in England, particularly for people who uh, often aren't able to access that kind of accommodation because of legal measures in the homelessness legislation or simply because they don't have recourse to public funds. No, I do think there's a moment to be captured here, actually, is what the whole conversation has been about, hasn't it? And all credit to you, you've been championing this for a number of years. And also, I think there's a citizen will as well. They reflect on what's happened over COVID and think some things just aren't right. And this is certainly in the, you know, pervasive rough sleeping just is not right. So I think there's a perfect moment for you. And I was also, I have to say, delighted to see you talking about housing first on a large scale. Because one of the things I've learned about this is although there's housing answers, there's also got to be support and genuine total answers. So I'd be very encouraging. You know, this it's time for a new approach based on that Finnish sort of philosophy. You know, yes, a, a roof over every head every night, every night, everyone in. And the measures that you've described in the emergency bill, I think, are, are fantastic uh, measures. Because if it was in law, the resource would have to follow uh, authorities in the West Midlands and Greater Manchester to, pro to provide for those legal, uh, those legal uh, requirements. And, um, you know, I would fully support um, 
the campaign that you're making. And actually, it isn't just the right thing to do. I think you can argue too that it, it is the more cost effective thing to do because if you help people recover and you don't allow them to end up in a spiral of chaos where they are kind of, you know, very challenging in many ways for all the public services to, to, to deal with. And, you know, it's, it's not fair on them. It's not fair on anybody. It just doesn't work for anybody. Let's get to a much more upfront preventative approach. And if your proposed bill is the start of it, then brilliant. Let's build from there. This hopefully, uh, though it's been a really testing time for all of us, is a reset moment. I hope it makes us all look at what we truly value in life. You know, the, the bill that you're proposing should be a, a kind of a, a new national mission about housing first. If you sort people's housing out properly, that is the foundation for everything else to, 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 to flow from it. If you don't do that and you leave people in a very precarious position of not earning enough at work and always at risk of eviction, the the wider societal problems you store up from that are are massive and everyone in has been a real step forward but you know let's let's capture that and build a political consensus around a new new approach to housing not just on rough sleeping but housing more generally healthcare is a human right universal but actually the healthcare can spending can often be wasted if people haven't got a good home to return to so you know if you're thinking about leveling up and resilience, I think you've got to have a new philosophy about housing. And um, I hope that will be a legacy of this time we've been living through. Okay, so I just want to say a huge thank you to Andy Street and Andy Burnham for joining us today. That's brilliant to have your thoughts on what's been going on locally in both of the regions, but also to have your support on the Home for All campaign and the importance of the emergency homelessness legislation. So thank you very much.